So the first part of the podcast was about how we measure the strength of the association between variables. And we've just seen that it can only be, that we're only measuring straight line association, but that's a, a defect which we'll have to put up with. The next step is how do we use this association in order to make predictions of one variable from another? So I want to return now to the data that we started with on heights and weights. If we look at the data that are, uh, you can see in front of you, we can see that there could be many possible lines that one could put through here. And we have a question about which line we should choose and why. There isn't an absolutely perfect answer as to which one we should use, but there is a conventional answer, uh, which is what's called simple linear regression using the least squares line. And I'm going to tell you about that next. So our goal, remember, is that we want to predict the value of the y variable, in this case, the weight of the student from the x variable, which is in this case the, the, the height of the student. So we need a model which we're going to use to inform us about how this prediction process will work. The model says that there's a straight line relationship between y and x, y equals alpha plus beta x, but there is also some error which we can or other variation which we commonly denote by the Greek letter epsilon. Unlike other areas of mathematics, this does not necessarily mean a small number. So just looking at the two parts here, we have the linear relationship, the straight line here, and we have this other variation. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, how do we go about finding what these two numbers are here, the intercept and slope of the straight line, that would be good to use for predicting for in a particular context. And the conventional answer is what's called the least squares line. The least squares line minimizes a particular quantity, which we'll look at both in terms of its formula and in terms of how it looks in, term in the picture. It minimizes a sum of squares, the sum over all the observations that we've got of what are called the squares of the residuals. This is a, the letter E, not the letter of epsilon up here, though there is a relationship between them. Where the residual EI is the difference between the actual observed value of the Y variable and the prediction which we would make for that value if we were using the line. So if we look at that here, the prediction which we would make using the line is this bit, which encodes the, the linear relationship. This is the bit that we don't know about. So we have the true value of y minus the prediction we would make is alpha plus beta xi. And our problem is that we want to choose alpha and beta to make these prediction errors small on the basis that if, they, if the prediction errors are small for the data we've already seen, then if we can assume it's reasonable to map that into other, other data, then it will, this procedure will also perform well in the context of, of observations where we haven't seen y, but we do know the value of x. Now to understand what's going on here, it's actually in many ways better to look at a picture of it, and so I'm going to show you uh, what these quantities, these EIs are, in terms of a, a, a graph of the data. So here again we have the data, and again we have a line overlaid on the data, but as well as the data values themselves, you'll see that the data are connected to the line. Each point has a vertical, little vertical gray line dropping down from it, from the point which is xi, yi, to the point which is on the line. The point which is on the line is xi on the, uh, on the x coordinate and the y hat i here as the y coordinate. So the, the gray segment in the plot that you're looking at represents this quantity ei. It's clearest in the context of the observation where the height of the student is about 162 centimeters, which I've highlighted by making that point colored green, where you can see there is a single vertical gray segment which connects the two. As we move the, the line around, uh, it will change the lengths of those gray segments, the lengths, the sizes of the EIs. When we move the line around, what we're doing is we're changing the values of alpha and beta. So the least squares line says that we should choose the, the particular straight line that goes through the data that makes the sum of the squares of those gray line segments as small as possible. And that is just a measure, a compromi compromise measure of the total error that's involved in this prediction process. The consequences of this procedure, the least squares principle, we can just write down for the moment and come back to how they're derived later. We find that the equation of the line is given by the following formula. The prediction for y minus the average of the y values we already have 
is some multiple b of the difference between the particular value of x we're interested in and the average of the x values that we've already seen. And the formula for b, as given in the uh, in A level books, usually is of the form Sxy over Sxx. I prefer to give it as the uh, correlation multiplied by the standard deviation of the y variable multiplied by the standard deviation of the x variable. And this is partly because it connects back to uh, how I prefer to present correlation in the first place, and partly because it emphasizes that in, in the entire computation, there are only five quantities of the data that are really involved. The average of the y variable, the average of the x variable, the standard deviation of the y variable, and the standard deviation of the x variable, none of which are to do with the association between the two variables, and the final component of the process is the correlation R between the two variables, the straight line association. Everything else about the data could be different, but if those five numbers were all the same, we would end up making the same predictions. And uh, it's because of that fact that I prefer the f this form of the uh, equation here, because it's not so clear as to what these uh, quantities here relate to in the first place. Okay. Turning again to the toy example, and just doing the calculations in case they will make things clearer. Using the numbers from earlier, using the A-level version of the formula, we find that B is 25 divided by 36, which is 0.694 to three decimal places. And so our formula for a prediction is that the prediction for Y, subtract two from it, is equal to this value of B, 0.694, multiplied by the difference between the value of X we're interested in and the the average value of the x variable. The average value of the x variable is minus three, so we get a plus three here. And we could now, for example, uh, predict the, the, the value of y if this was an interesting example by plugging in a particular uh, value of x. Making a prediction is at this point quite straightforward uh, with any particular regression model. If we have a value of x of interest, we just plug it into the equation, now it comes a value of y hat. One thing we might be interested in at this point is how accurate would that process typically be? How, sh how much should we trust the prediction? In which case, we can calculate very easily here the typical size of the prediction errors. Because we already had that available. It is, in fact, the standard deviation of the residuals, but it's the square root of 1 upon n times the sum from i equals 1 up to n of the sum of squares of the residuals. So, so this is... Uh, just a measure of the typical size of the prediction errors uh, based on the calculation that we were doing when we were putting together the, the line through the data. This is the quantity that we were minimizing to try to choose the line, and then we're just averaging by dividing by n and taking the square root to do undo the effect of the squaring error here. So this quantity, in principle, involves an elaborate qu uh, calculation, but it's available to us very easily here by just taking the standard deviation of the y variable and multiplying by the square root of 1 minus r squared. So again, we see that the important things that happen in this process depend only on the means and standard deviations of the two variables and on the, the strength of the correlation between them. What we don't see from all of this is why all of these things are true. And that's the subject of the rest of this podcast.